Today we're going to do a, a rolling, a whole class on rolling, maybe a little bit of sliding. And uh, I think some of you will find some of this stuff a little bit challenging. Uh, and some of it is intuitive, some of it is not intuitive. So I'm just going to start out with a quiz. It's not that you should know the answer to the quiz, it's just to get your head in the room. And the quiz goes like this. Let's say we have this point D, and we have something which is rolling along like this, and we would like to know the velocity of point D. And some candidate directions for the velocity of point D are like this. And we're going to assume that this is rolling uh, this way. And we can call these uh, A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, so you want to put A, B, C, D, or E. And E is none of the above. And these are all about the velocity of D. Do I have it pointed in the right direction? Or is it none of the above or cannot be determined would be uh, a legitimate answer here. And I'd like you to do this without discussion, just quietly. Think to yourself and vote. You got, uh, yes, what's your question? There's what? It's rolling without slipping. The meaning of rolling means no slipping. Four, three, two, get those clickers out. Two seconds left. One, half a second left. Quarter of a second left. Okay, let's see how you voted. Uh, get it up there on the screen, I hope. Okay, so some of you voted C, and some of you voted D. Okay, I have not recorded the correct answer yet. There's always this A and B and E. Okay, you can change your votes. Yes? It's rolling on the ground without slipping. That's what rolling means. Okay, five seconds to change your votes. One, two, on. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, good. Uh, so how do we get the right answer? Well, one way we can do it is experimentally. We can take this thing out. We can roll it along here. While it's rolling along here, we can mark some point, hold our finger firmly on that point while this rolls along, watch the path of this thing, and the path of this thing is like so. It's hard to, it's hard to uh, hold it there, but it goes like that. So this is the actual path. So the right answer is C by experiment. Now how do we know that uh, in a way that we could think it through without doing the experiment? Is this point here, let me call this point C prime, and now there's a point down here which is C. The key to this is that the velocity of C is equal to the velocity of C prime. That is the velocity of the point on the wheel which is at the ground. That's a material point. That's a piece of rubber or on the side. When I was a kid, computer disks looked like this. This is one megabyte computer disk. Huge. A million bytes on this thing. OK. Only about 16,000 times smaller than when you've gotten your thumb drive. OK. Uh, so we take this piece of rubber, or this piece of disk, this bit of data on the bottom, and we look at this point on the ground. And if they are, if the ground is impenetrable, this point C prime cannot have a downwards velocity. It's touching the ground, so it doesn't have an upwards velocity. And it's not sliding, so it doesn't have a sideways velocity. So this point has zero velocity. Now, any two points on a rigid object are going in circles around each other. And in particular, this point D is going in circles around this bottom point. No matter how this is moving, that's true. But if the bottom point has zero velocity, 
then this point is going circles around this point, which is stationary, which means its velocity is perpendicular, is tangent to the circle that goes from here to here, and therefore that's the direction C, which was marked there, perpendicular to the line from C prime to D. So VD is perpendicular to the position uh, of D relative to C prime. And that's how we get this answer. Any questions about this answer? Yes? Say again. OK, so C prime is a point on this wheel. It's marked right there like that. It's touching the ground. It's not passing through the ground, so it doesn't have a downwards velocity. It's not lifting off the ground. It doesn't have an upwards velocity. Actually, it was going down just before it got there, and it's going up afterwards. But right when it's touching, its upwards velocity is 0. And it's not sliding, so it's got no sideways velocity. If it's got no y velocity and no x velocity, it's got no velocity. Two points which are touching without sliding on any two objects have no relative velocity. It's a little fact. If you have any two points on any two objects like this, I'll call this C and I'll call this C prime. If there is contact with no sliding, that implies that the velocity of C is equal to the velocity of C prime. And in the case of the problem on the side, one of the objects that was being touched was the ground, which has zero velocity. Okay, any more questions about this? Okay, let's just look a little bit more at the kinematics of rolling. So we're going to use exactly the same picture, so I'll draw the picture again. Here's the picture. Here's the ground. I have this point C prime, which is on the object. This point C is on the ground. I've got the center point, which if it's a homogeneous object, is the center of mass. All I'm going to use for the kinematics, kinematics meaning geometry, is that it has, uh, it's at the center of the circle. This circle has a radius of, say, r. And we want to keep track of various points. So we can put a wall over here like this. And we can keep track of the position of this thing. And we can call this, say, xg. And there might be a point we're keeping track of, like this, which has moved along this arc this much. So we can keep track of the amount of rolling, which is theta. Somebody laughed with something funny. This is serious stuff. If we're going to keep track of the angular velocity, in terms of the normal sign convention, the angular velocity will be minus theta dot k, because I've defined theta to be clockwise here. I should put a unit vectors here so we know what direction is what. Now we want to keep track of how far this thing has rolled, what we can notice is that the distance of rolling, the distance traveled, is the equal to s, which is equal to the arc length on the circle, and which is also equal to this xg. So as this rolls along, s is equal to x, is, uh, xg because these points are always matching. But there are other ways to look at this. The most important is to use the Laurie-Anderson equation. So this is the most important uh, equation for rolling, is this contact equation. So remember the song I played last time, let x equals x. Well, in this case, x is equal to vc. There's a point on the ground. That point on the ground is equal to the velocity. The velocity of the point on the ground is equal to the velocity of the point on the ground. And now let's think about it two different ways. On the one hand, the velocity of the point on the ground is 0 because it's on the ground and the ground is not moving. On the other hand, the velocity of the point on the ground is the velocity of C prime, the point which is touching the ground and not moving relative to it. 
but that c prime has a velocity of g plus the velocity of c prime with respect to g. But the velocity of c prime with respect to g is omega cross the position of c prime with respect to g. c prime is going in circles relative to g. It's got a velocity relative to g, which is going in circles, which is a theta dot r. And a different way of writing theta dot r is omega cross r. That gives us all the directions right for that polar coordinate formula. But this r is equal to minus rj. And this vg is equal to the velocity of g in the i direction. It's stuck uh, off the ground a fixed distance, so it can only move to the right. So this whole thing turns into vgi plus negative theta dot k crossed with minus rj. And this whole thing is equal to 0. Now, this thing is a vector equation. We'd like to pull off uh, one or another component of it. But here we have an i component. Here we have a k cross j. k cross j is in the minus i direction. So all that survives this vector equation is something in the i direction, at least for this point c prime. If we picked a different point, it would be in a different direction. But if we take this thing then and take the dot product with i, we can uh, work out what this, this thing is. So do that yourself just so you get used to doing these dot products. Just do it yourself. Fill in the next line in your notes just so you get good at that algebra. This first term gives us uh, 0. Vg i dot i gives us Vg. k cross j is minus i. And minus, minus, minus is minus i. So we get minus theta dot r. Uh, and that's all that we get. OK, who? Uh, did get that when they did the algebra. OK, who did not? You don't have to admit it. OK, so then we have this equation that Vg is equal to theta dot r. And this is an intuitive enough equation. Uh, it's not that you wouldn't have thought of this yourself, but this gives you a, a careful, reasoned way to get that result. Now, this equation is true for all time. So even though point C is, uh, is, is moving around in this funny path, point C here, some point that we're looking at, has, uh, ends up moving along in this funny path, this funny path like this. What is this funny path? It's got a name. This path is called a cycloid, and it's a famous, uh, famous, uh, it's a famous curve for a number of reasons. Usually upside down, actually. But anyway, it's the path of a particle on the edge of a tire. It's the path of a rock in your car tire or bike tire when you're going down the road. This thing is true for all time if we're looking at a sequence of points that are on the ground. So from this, we get that the acceleration of g is equal to theta double dot times r, which is not surprising. And we also get that xg is equal to 
um, minus, what, uh, let's see, what did I do wrong sine-wise? Theta is fine. Uh, xg is equal to theta r plus some constant. OK. And the minus sign only shows up here with the omega, because omega we took is positive in the counterclockwise direction. If we want to go back and apply this reasoning for point d here, and let's find out what is the velocity of point D. We can go back and say the velocity of point D is equal to the velocity of point G plus omega uh, cross the position of D with respect to G. So this would be VGI uh, plus a negative theta dot um, K crossed with minus R I, and then you work out this cross product. It gives us that the velocity of d is equal to, well, vg we have is minus theta dot r. So it's minus theta dot r in the i direction. Uh, plus k crossed i is j minus minus gives us a plus j. So this gives us plus uh, theta dot r. This has a plus in it. This has a plus in it. Plus theta dot r j. And that's equal to theta dot r times i plus j. And this is what we got from before. This is what we got by the pictures. Check equals same as picture at the start of the lecture. Yes? What is xg equal to? Plus uh, I don't know what that was meant to be. C1? Now that we know this kinematics, we can use it to do mechanics problems. So there are a variety of mechanics problems we can think about doing. And there, there's three I would like to do. I don't know how far I'm going to get. The first one is the heat treatment of aluminum. So this is not superficial. You say now we're combining MEE 212 and 10, 20, 30. Wouldn't it be great if the courses were integrated? Anyway, this is a movie called The Heat Treatment of Aluminum, made in 1955 or something like that. And I used to have a projector that I could show it to you, and we could learn about the heat treatment of aluminum, but that's not what we're going to use it for. We're going to use this movie. You can, if you have a magnifying glass, you can look at it. It's about the heat treatment of aluminum. We're going to use it as a mechanics problem. So first, I want to find a way to get this table kind of level. So does this want to roll one way or another? Not too much. OK, so now if I pull slowly on this thing, not too hard, in that direction, which way is this going to go? Now, I don't want people to answer out loud. And again, I don't want you to talk to each other. But the first thing is, how many people have seen this example on YouTube, in their high school physics, somewhere else like that. Raise your hand if you know this example. Okay, so half of you know the example, so therefore you're going to get the right, right answer. Uh, where do you see this before? Just three or four people? Physics 112 did this one? Anywhere else? Physics in high school. Okay, so you guys, have, you guys don't get the fun here. Um, so the question is, which way does this go? Uh, we're going to vote on it. Um, 
I think we'll keep the votes secret. Now that's a good that's a good point. <laughs> it's tough to vote. So we've got this problem like this in the spool, and we're pulling it like this, and it's stuck on the ground like this. And the question is, does it go to the left? Does it stay still? Does it go to the right? Cannot be determined. Uh, and anybody got another? Anybody got an answer that's not covered there? It <laughs> goes up. Okay, you have five seconds to vote. One, two, three, four, five, and the vote. And we have it goes to the left. It goes stay still, or it goes to the right. Okay, that's good. Any way we look at it, at least half of you have a big learning opportunity here, right? Every time you get something wrong, that's your big opportunity for learning. Are you ready? Do you want somebody else to do it? You're like, oh, do you, does anybody not trust me? getting wobbly in this old age. Okay. Just do it the other way, make sure it's not something about the magnetic fields or something like that. Okay. So now can we figure that out? Not only can we figure it out, can we make it so that it's intuitive? So we'd like to make this an intuitive result, not just a, a factual result. So we're going to do this example, is the spool, and we'd like to try to work it out somewhat carefully. So we start out with a sketch like this. We've got a picture like this. We've got the tape coming off like this. We draw a free body diagram which looks like this. It's got some force here. It's got some force over here. I'll call this FC. Uh, I call this NC, I can call this point C or C prime, I've got this point G, I've got this other point, I can call this point D, it's not the same as the point D we had before. Um, we're going to keep track of things like this, I and J, we'll keep our sign convention uh, nice for doing cross products and stuff like that, so we'll call angular velocity positive in that direction. Uh, this, this wheel has to have some radius, so it has some capital R. Uh, this inner wheel has some radius, it has some little r. This thing has some mass. It's got some moment of inertia about the center of mass. Uh, probably a reasonable guess for this one is that that would be one half m uh, little r squared, because most of the mass is in the film, which only goes out to little r. Uh, you should know how to calculate that i if you uh, don't know how to do it already. Okay, now we want to do mechanics on this thing. We don't really care about, this re about these reaction forces because we're just trying to figure out how this thing moves. So we try to find a mechanics equation that doesn't have in it the things that we don't know and don't care about. Okay, so how do we do that? We take, say, the sum of moments relative to some point C and that's equal to not zero because we're not doing statics anymore. It's equal to h dot with respect to c. Now what is h dot with respect to c? It's the sum of r cross ma of all the particles in the system. But there's a shortcut formula for that, uh, for that, for rigid objects, which is it's the position of the center of mass relative to c crossed with the acceleration of the center of mass times the total mass plus I omega K, where we better have uh, used the right sign convention for omega, the one that makes the cross products give the right answer. So that's why it's important that I picked omega to be counterclockwise. 
Otherwise, formulas like this are going to give us trouble because this, all, this has an implied sign convention. Counterclockwise is positive. Now, what is this AG? Well, we knew that the velocity of G was minus omega times capital R. Therefore, this AG is equal to minus omega dot R. And we figured this out earlier in lecture. Where did we figure that out? We figured that out uh, right up here. Remember, theta dot was minus omega. So this is minus omega dot right there. So I can call this equation star and refer back to this as equation star. And this one is not supposed to be omega. It's supposed to be alpha, which is omega dot. Or we can put here alpha. On the left-hand side, we have the moments here. So we have the position of the force relative to g crossed with this force in the i direction. Now, actually, the force does not act at d. It acts over at this point here. But you can take any force and slide it along this line of action without changing any of its mechanical effects. What do I mean mechanical effects? It's effects in linear momentum balance or angular momentum balance equations. So I could have gone r and called this point e with respect to c and taken the cross product. But this part of the cross product would have given 0 anyway. And that's the same as saying you can slide the force back to point d and, and get the same result. So I could have put here position of E with respect to G, and then we would have got the same answer. So this cross product we can do in our heads. It's R minus R. That's how far up it is, times F. And let's see, it's pointed into the board, so it gets a minus K over here. And then on the right-hand side, we have here an R times I. Uh, this acceleration of G was this thing. If we put the acceleration of G like this, I can put an I up here like that. Uh, G with respect to C was RJ, not RI. Then we do this cross product. We have J crossed with I, which is minus K. But we have a minus here, so we have minus, minus k. That turns into a plus. So this then has an r in it, and it has an r in it. So it's an r squared m, and this whole thing turns into r squared m omega dot. And now we want to get the signs correct, and this is an omega dot k. So then we get from this thing, if we take the dot product of both sides with k, we get from this that omega dot, and remember, omega dot was measured positive in that direction. Omega dot has this minus sign in it. It's equal to minus r, sorry, it's equal to minus r minus r f over i g plus m r squared. So omega dot, that's the acceleration in the counterclockwise direction, is a negative number because r minus r is um, a positive number. So this is less than 0. It implies that the omega vector, omega dot vector, is equal to something in the clockwise direction, because omega dot with this sign convention was counterclockwise, which means it accelerates to the right. Yes? This is our d slash c. And this is our e slash c. That was a mistake. Typographical, chalkographical error. Thank you. Other questions or mistakes in the blackboard? You feel like you want to say something, yes? Okay, so we picked our sign convention for omega 
to be counterclockwise positive because all our cross product formulas are based on that. For example, to write velocity is omega cross r depends on our taking omega to be counterclockwise. Okay, it's sort of like the sign, it's sort of like in 3D you have to have right handed coordinate systems. With, with cross products and omegas, you have to have a consistency with the, with the direction of the angular velocity vector that you want a positive in the k direction according to the right hand rule, which is counterclockwise. It's the sign convention that makes omega cross r equal v. Okay. Omega dot, omega is a symbol. That quantity is less than zero. That quantity measures how much it is in the counterclockwise direction. So the amount of counterclockwiseness is negative, which means it is clockwise. Just like if we had velocity in the x direction, and I said if the velocity in the x direction was negative, then that would mean the velocity is that way. The angular velocity this way, the angular acceleration this way is negative, therefore the angular acceleration is that way. Other question? Yes? With Rob Slip. I said, yes, I did actually. It was subtle. I said, I'm going to pull gently. Let's just do another vote here. And I'm not going to um, put this on the eye clicker. But what if I pull hard here? Which way is it going to go? How many people think it's going to go? I'm going to pull hard. I'm going to go mm, like that. How many people think it's going to roll that way? Raise your hand. How many people think it's going to roll that way? Raise your hand. OK. Pay close attention to me. This is a learning opportunity for all of you, almost, it looked like. Are you ready? Remember what you said. Remember what you said. Now we're going to, how are we going to know what this movie is about? Oh, the title goes on. Okay. So you're going to say, oh, I didn't mean it went that way. I meant it spins that way. So it's true. If I pull hard, the friction force becomes negligible, as if I'm doing it in space. I'm pulling that direction. Therefore, there's a torque in that direction, and it rotates this way. That is correct. But for any object in space, not in space, whatever, the acceleration of the object acceleration of the center mass is the force divided by the mass. Remember the one big equation we started the semester with? F equals ma. Always true. Any system, including this, the force on this system, which is that, plus a little friction force, let's just pretend it's negligible. If the force is that way, the thing accelerates that way. Okay. Let's take this vote again. I'm going to pull hard in that direction. Which way does it go? How many people say that way? How many people say that way? Very good. Any questions about that? So it's really, it's really not a joke, the thing I say, learning opportunity. It really is true. When you make a mistake, that is your biggest opportunity to learn. So you want to stop and confront the mistake, think about why you made it, think about what's wrong, and try and resolve that cognitive dissonance between what I say and what you think, and then learn something. Yes? OK, are you being creative, or are you sit repeating something you saw in class? Did you see this in class before? OK, bonus points. Very good for you. OK, assuming you're honest. If I pull in this direction gently, which way is it going to go? that way. How about we pull this direction gently? Which way is it going to go? To the right. Can anybody tell me what the dividing case is between whether it goes this way or this way? Think about it for a minute. In fact, talk to your friend. See if you can figure out by talking to your friend what, is the, what distinguishes this case from this case. Talk about it. Make a lot of noise while I go yell at the people in the last four rows.
Who has an answer to the question? Who has, just don't yell out the answer. Who has an answer to the question? Okay. If you've seen this before, you're not, if you knew the answer before class, you're not allowed to answer. Who has a new answer to the question that did not know it before class? Yes? I think it's when the, the point C. That is exactly correct. Okay, so if we look at a, so just think about what he said. Let me erase the blackboard here before I go on. So if I take this situation like so, and like so, and I've got a free body diagram over here that looks like this, and I've got a point C, and I'm going to consider pulling this like this, or I'm going to consider pulling this like this, or I'm going to consider pulling this like this. In all cases, the way I'm going to solve this problem is by doing, using angular momentum balance about point C. In this case, which is the same as the case I did, I started the lecture with, the moment of this force about point C is in that direction, so we better get a motion in that direction to balance angular momentum balance about this point. On the other hand, in this case, what did I just say? Complete nonsense. In this case, we get a torque in that direction, and we better get angular momentum balance, we better get motion in that direction, and R cross MA that way. Whereas in this case, we get a torque in that direction, it better move that way. Now if you're watching at home, all you home viewers, go back 15 seconds, delete that little section of the video where my brain went inside out and backwards, and I said that this thing had a torque in that direction, that was nonsense. Okay. The distinguishing case, the critical case, is where this goes like this, and this force goes right through point C, and then it doesn't, the moment of that force about point C is neither positive nor negative, and this thing doesn't know what to do. So I try and pull this, and I just can't do anything, and I can't even satisfy the rolling constraint. All I can do is drag it and violate the rolling constraint if that line goes through point C. If it goes above point C, I get rolling that way. If it goes to the right from your point of view of point C, it rolls that way. Okay, any questions about the, either the calculations or the intuition? Yes? If I used what? Well, it doesn't. Here, I've got a vertical angle. Everything's fine. I go this way. Everything's fine. Now, the geometry changes in time. Here, the geometry doesn't change in time. Over here, the geometry doesn't change in time. And in this special case where I try to do it like this, the, if, I just, if I just move my hand vertically, then the geometry changes over time. But I'm only trying to catch this at one instant, or I assume that as I pull this, I move this along and keep this vertical. Actually, here's another fun problem since I've got this tape here, which is also somewhat unintuitive. If I just drop this like this, so I've got this vertical, and the center of mass is off to your left relative to this line, does this thing start to swing or not? And let's imagine I'm doing this from the top of the clock tower, does this fall straight down? Does it swing to this side? Does it swing to that side? How many people think it if I did this from the top of the clock tower that this would swing to the right? Raise your hand. How many think it would not? Why not? You draw a free body diagram. There's a vertical force on this because the tape can only apply a vertical force. 
There's a vertical force from gravity. There is no horizontal force on this system. It just falls straight down. It's not the same as a statics problem where I had a crooked weight and it ends up hanging the center of mass under the fulcrum. It's a dynamics problem. Dynamics problems work differently. So this just falls straight down. You can tell I did this experiment before. Why is that? Because the rolling experiment was messed up from this thing bent up. How did it get bent up? It got bent up by doing what I'm about to do for you. Ready? Wait a second. On camera. Ready? Get, turn on the slow motion video. OK, what do you see? Play it back in slow motion. What you saw was this falling straight down. The fast camera guys, YouTube video. Okay, any questions about that? Look what I did. What if I had started this thing? Yes, if the force is not vertical, if I start this over here, then there'll be a force on it in this direction, and it will start to swing that way. I, you know what? I don't know. But that would be a great problem for you to work out if you want to like test your understanding of mechanics. Would it swing through, or would it just come in getting falling more and more like that? I don't know. Anybody think they know? OK, let's you show me that. Any other questions? OK. Here's a classical problem. We have something rolling down a ramp. And let's say it's a disc or a ball or something like that. And it's got some mass. It's got some moment of inertia. It's got some g. Uh, this is going like this. This has some theta. This is exactly the kind of problem you would like to think you could have done a long time ago. But it's not actually as simple as it looks, so it's not that hard either. How are we going to figure out how this thing moves? We'll pick a sign convention for i and j. We'll also assume that omega is equal to omega k, that counterclockwise uh, sign convention for omega. How are we going to work this out? We draw a free body diagram. You draw the free body diagram while I erase the blackboard. So we've got this object like so. We have minus mgj like so. And over here, we've got a dotted line that's not part of the system we're analyzing, but I show it for reference. We've got a normal force here, and we've got a friction force. I don't know whether it points up the hill or down the hill. I'll call it a friction force. It's not equal to mu times n unless it's sliding. So let's assume that this is a rolling example, not a sliding example. And we have a point uh, G here. We have a point C here like this. And we would like to uh, figure out how this thing moves. We can pick uh, directions along the ramp and normal to the ramp. And we can say, let's look at sum of moments relative to point C equals H dot relative to point C. So what do we get for the moments about point C? We get this distance times this force. So we get an MGR, but we only get a sine theta of it. So we have MGR sine theta. You can work out the cross products and make sure you agree. 
and that's pointed in the minus k direction. And then for the right-hand side, we have the position of G with respect to C crossed with M A G in the lambda direction, because we're assuming this is staying on the ground, so we know the acceleration. And then we have plus I G alpha K. And I think I'll just pick up this example next time. But before we leave, almost everybody here got something wrong in the experiments. You can't accuse me of doing, oh, abstract stuff on the blackboard. It's all so crazy math. He's doing everything the hard way. I did, uh, the hard way. I did physical experiments, and almost every one of you got something wrong, which is OK. It's good. It doesn't, it's not bad. That's good. Take advantage of what you got wrong and use that to try to understand what's going on.